Hello, my friend and friend. My name is Kevin, and here at my channel, I help people fall in love with CSS. And if I can't get you to fall in love with it, I'm hoping to at least help you be a little bit less frustrated by it. And we're doing that today by exploring Grid's auto-fit syntax and how to get it to work for you. Uh, or repeat syntax, I should be saying, with auto-fit and auto-fill specifically. Uh, we're going to be starting off, just in case you're new to Grid in general and you're just a bit frustrated by how much there is to it, the first thing I'm going to say is display Grid put a gap on there, you already have something. Uh, and you can see here, I just have like a bunch of product cards, nothing too fancy, uh, that are all just stacking because that's what Grid does by default. And that's why the only one that you need most of the time uh, is Grid template columns, template columns like this. These three declarations are the ones with grid that get you like 90% of the way there with most things you're gonna be doing. And then there's like, yeah, it can get more complicated, but just this on its own, with some basic things that we're gonna be looking at in this video, we'll get you so much of what you need to do. So the very first thing on this grid template columns is we need to have columns. So let's just say 300 pixels a few times. We're gonna work our way up just to really make sure we're understanding how all of this is actually working. We don't need all these, I'm gonna hide those away. <laughs> I accidentally hit save and it formatted my code. So with this, I have three columns and they're 300 pixels each. Fairly simple to understand. The problem is it quickly causes some overflow because we've said exactly how big they need to be. When we're using grid, instead of saying like specific values like this, a really handy thing to do is one FR instead. And FR just means distribute the space equally. And because it's one for each of them, or it's about how we're gonna distribute the space, I should say. And because it's one for each of them, it just means each of them gets an equal distribution of the space that's available. And so now we have squishy columns. So that's pretty cool. Uh, if you just need to go from like one to three columns, the easiest thing to do is use a media or container query, uh, but we'll say a media query, where if the width is greater than 960 pixels, this is probably a little bit too big, but we can wrap all of that in my media query. And this is using nesting. So you can now nest media queries within selectors in CSS. And this is the range syntax uh, for media queries, which is this is the width greater than 960 pixels. And now we can see that when I get to smaller screen sizes, they stack, and then we get to three columns. If that's all you need, then you're off and running. You're, you're happy. Uh, we could simplify this a little bit. Instead of saying one FR like this and repeating how many times, we could say this is a repeat of three comma one FR. And now it does exactly the same thing. The only advantage is if you wanna change how many columns you have, say within another media query, it just becomes a little bit easier to do because we just make this number larger. <laughs> and that's all, right? So uh, let's make this one like 1200 or something, 1280. And so we go from one column to three columns to five columns. The problem with all of this is we have to decide what media queries we're gonna be using and breakpoints. It's annoying when you have to come up with them, but if you do need jumps like this, this would be the simplest approach to take. If you don't really care how many columns you have though, you just want the browser to figure it out and add them, that's where the we can do a little bit more with this repeat syntax here. So let's take off this media query and remove all of this and go back to a single declaration right here of our grid template columns. And I'm gonna break this down by putting this on another line because this is gonna become long. And I'm also gonna show you my trick to remembering the pattern that we're gonna be using here, just because it is a longer pattern. Uh, and yeah, I want you to remember what it is. So repeat, three comma one FR works great, but we might not know how many columns we said, right? So what we do for that is we use the auto fit keyword. There is also an auto fill keyword. At the end of the video, I'll explain the difference between the two of them. But we're gonna start with auto fit first. And then I have to say, what are we auto fitting? One FR is never going to work here because that just means take up the available space. So it, I mean, it is working, it's taking up the available space. Uh, but generally we want to put values in here. So I could come in with like 300 pixels and now as long as the column can be 300 pixels, it's going to squeeze it in and fit. So we're sort of getting there, but the problem with this is like, it's kind of weird or annoying that we have empty space there and they don't grow to fit that space. And we want that, I guess, more of like a flex box behavior almost, right? Where they're stretching and, and shrinking, but we just saw that behavior where we could make them stretch and shrink using the FR. So how can we combine one FR with this 300 pixels? To do that, we're gonna come here and I'm gonna put a min max, which is a grid exclusive uh, function that we have. And on the min max, as the name implies, we're setting a minimum size and a maximum size. So this is my minimum size, comma, 
and then I put my maximum. We already saw the FR worked, and if I come in with that, it's gonna continue to work. So as this is getting smaller, we're reducing how many columns we have, and there we go. And as we get bigger, it adds to the column count that we have. The nice thing with this is it just works. <laughs> don't have to worry about it. And it's doing that by going, the smallest any column can be is 300. So how many columns can I fit at any given time? So say, say like this breakpoint here that's happening. It's going, oh, I can't fit three of them next to each other. They're hitting this minimum and it takes the gaps and everything else into account. So it can't fit them all next to one another. So instead of trying to squeeze them in next to each other, we just remove a column and now they, they grow and fill that space instead. And it's going back to this one FR that's right here. And it just works, it's so good. Uh, the one problem with this is, if you're at small sizes for your columns, you'll be completely fine. But if you come in with large sizes here, because it's just what your design needs, where you only need the columns to come in at like a fairly large size, that can mean at smaller screen sizes, you're gonna run into some overflow. Because we're saying the smallest this is allowed to get is 500 pixels. There is a fix to this, uh, which just takes this already very long declaration <laughs> that has a few unique things to it. Repeat is unique to grid, auto fit is unique to grid, min max is unique to grid. We're gonna add one more layer to this. This extra layer is not unique to grid. You could do this wherever you want, but I'm gonna come here and instead of 500 pixels, we're gonna say min 500 will be part of it, but we'll have a min function as my minimum value, which seems really bizarre. But I'll explain what this is doing. <laughs> we're, we're gonna come in here, do comma 100%. So now what we're saying is the minimum value is either 500 or 100%. Which one of these two is smaller? So let's go and take a look now. So you can see it's working how it was before, but now if we get to the smaller size, it continues to squish. Because as soon as the grid, this 100% this is looking at the size of that we have available, right? The size of our grid, or I guess it might be the size of the parent, but it should be the same size uh, because the grid's always gonna fill up the space unless you're doing something weird, I guess. But this this works for me every time I've ever used it. So the only value here that's ever changing is this one. And as I said, when we get here, it's gonna be looking at the 500 because 500 is obviously smaller than 100%, which is huge. But as soon as the 100% is actually smaller, which would probably be in this range, I see my, my viewport, it's really small and maybe under my head. Um, but the, the we have like 400, 500 pixels here. So this 100% is now smaller than this value. So now that minimum size is gonna match the, the size of my parent, this grid here, and the column will just be that big instead of going to that minimum of 500. Now you're probably saying, how am I ever going to remember this? First of all, you can make this more readable, <laughs> uh, makes it a little bit longer, but we can make this more readable by coming in and doing a variable here. So I could say var min call size. And then either you could put a fallback value here if you wanted, or you could just come on your grid and whatever your class name is. I often call this auto grid instead of just grid, but I could say min call size is 500 pixels. And you don't really need to remember this anymore. You could just have this as a snippet that you use in your projects and copy paste it in. And when you need to make adjustments to it, like right now it's still working at 500, but I could come here and just adjust this number because this is the only thing that's important here. Everything else, every time you use this will be the same, except as I said, this might be an autofill. We'll talk more about that after. But now you can see it's working with the 300 pixels. So one way you could do it is definitely using this as a snippet that you just reuse. If you do wanna remember it, I write this one a lot. And even then I, I've, despite writing this all the time, I get mixed up because there's like the parentheses changing at different places. There's lots of parentheses involved in here and everything else. So it, it is easy to like misplace where things go. And I've come up with this pattern. So let's do it again. Auto grid, display grid, gap, whatever you need for your gap. And then it would be a grid template columns. And on the grid template columns, I'm gonna, let's delete this so I can't cheat and be looking at it while, while we're at this. And it's always going to be repeat. Inside the repeat, it's what am I repeating? So it's either auto fill or auto fit. I always start with an auto fit. So I'm gonna put that. And then we come in with what we want. Well, we're repeating, we're using auto fit. So it's always gonna be a min max, min max like that. And then with the min max, we need a min value and a max value. Min value, I need to have my min. And then I do comma one FR. That way, whenever I follow it and I do it that way, 
I always get this in the right spot because if I put this later on, I always mix up where the comma should go and I often end up with it over here. So one more time, repeat, we need an auto fit comma min max. Inside the min max, I need a minimum value. So I will put a min function comma one fr. And that's because this is my minimum and that is my maximum. So we're separating them with that comma. Then I can come inside the min and either I can put the size that I want directly. So my min is always going to be a size comma 100%. So it's always every single time, the exact same pattern, just with this value changing. So repeat auto fit min max, put the min function after the min function comma one FR, then go inside the min function and come in with a size comma 100%. And to make it more readable, often we do our var min call size, and then you end up with a very long declaration, probably the longest that you'll ever write in CSS, especially if it's on like one line like this. Uh, <laughs> it just looks really long, but super, super useful to have. Now on to the differences, and I, I broke things, <laughs> I called this auto grid. Uh, let's move this over here to fix it, even though we don't really need to. This this will be linked in the description by, you know, if you want this, this code. Uh, but there we go, it's working, we're happy with that. But it raises the question, <laughs> I've been talking about it a lot, auto fit and auto fill. And so let's jump over to this version where we have the exact same demo set up. Uh, just it looks a bit more complicated because I've used some custom properties to enable some toggling and some changing here. So we're not gonna worry about the code, it's exactly what I showed you. The main difference is I have a drop down where it's gonna let me switch between auto fit and auto fill. And if I do that right now, you'll actually see it's not changing. It looks exactly the same. And this is one of the things that causes some confusion when we're using auto fit and auto fill is they can feel like they're exactly the same. My first suggestion is try one. If it's not the right one, try the other. Uh, and if they're both doing the same thing, then you probably don't have to worry about it <laughs> too much. But the difference is if you don't have enough elements, so let's go back to auto fit and let's go to having three elements. And we saw that before, right? When this would get bigger and smaller, it would like squish and grow and they'd, they'd be growing to fill the available space, which is awesome. I love this behavior. But let's say we have something that's like sorting our elements and maybe we'll go up to like all eight. So we have two rows of content here. And if you're sorting elements, not by how many you wanna see, I guess this is a type of sorting, but maybe it's a portfolio piece, right? And you're sorting by like all projects or front end projects, back end projects, something like that. And you drop, you know, the selection goes from eight and then when you filter it, you go down to three elements. It's kind of weird that they all get bigger to stretch across that space because all of a sudden the layout is shifting and that's where auto fill comes in. And auto fill, if we turn on our dev tools here and I have these off screen, let me just pull it in. I'm gonna turn my grid on, uh, not that grid, this grid on. And so we can see our grid and what the auto fill is doing versus auto fit is auto fill will add columns that are empty even if, the, if there's no content for it. Whereas when I'm using auto fit, it's never gonna add extra columns in there. If there's no extra elements to fill in, it doesn't, it doesn't put them in. Auto fill will add extra columns that are blank. And the reason this is handy, as I said, is you might have something filtering elements. And then when you're filtering how many you have, the layout is never changing and it feels much more natural. So if it's something where the number of elements might change, but you need that layout to maintain, you know, stay and you don't mind empty areas being generated from that, that's auto fill. If you prefer something where it's going to be a bit more squishy, let's go up to like five. So this where it's things are more squishy, but at larger sizes, maybe I should have done four. <laughs> they, they stretch and they fill across the space. If that empty space is available for it, that's when you'd use your auto fit. Uh, they both have use cases. It really depends on the situation you're in. And as I said, it's a little bit like margin and padding when you're first learning those. If you're not sure which one to use, try one. If it's not doing what you want it to, try the other. You just need to know that the two behaviors exist and the words are similar enough that it doesn't really matter which one you do. It should be easy enough to remember the two of them. And with that, I really hope that you enjoyed this video. If you did and you haven't yet subscribed, I'm coming up on a million subscribers, but it's going pretty slow. So I'd really appreciate a sub if you haven't yet subscribed. Um, also, if you just want more CSS goodness, that's all we do here or 99% of what I do here. So yeah, if, if that's the type of thing and these types of tutorials are useful for you, definitely consider subscribing at the very least. And I think that's it. So thank you very much to my supporter of Awesome Johnny, as well as all my other patrons and channel members for their continued support. And of course, until next time, don't forget to make your corner of the internet just a little bit more awesome.